with Max Karg here. So one of the things that, that intrigues me is uh, really monetizing or finding a passion, something that you love and turning that into a business, a side hustle, something, right? So obviously you're a car enthusiast and you, Big time. you know, yeah. you create content around that and you kind of help car enthusiasts uh, become automotive entrepreneurs per se, right? So exactly. before we even talk about that, kind of give us your origin story of how you got into like how you, how you find your passion for automotives? Yeah, so uh, I've always kind of been into cars, played all the video games, like watched Tokyo Drift and the uh, yeah. the Fast and Furious series growing up. So like movies with Paul Walker um, and like Vin Diesel, all the Fast and Furious series. Um, car people will know all the games like Forza, Midnight Club, Need for Speed, yeah. all the different games like that. Um, so I was pretty big into cars, but nobody in my family was necessarily in the auto industry. Um, so I, when I was in school, um, grew up pretty normal, uh, from a really small town in the Midwest, um, and worked at Dairy Queen. So that was my first job, fast food, making like seven twenty five or seven thirty five an hour. Um, and I would of course, like always think about cars cause that was what I was into sports and school and cars were kind of. Mm -hmm like the big things at that point in life. Um, and so coworkers obviously chat, we're talking about like our personal lives, what's new, all this different stuff. Um, so I was talking to one of my coworkers one day um, about just like what she had planned for this weekend, what's new. And she was getting a new car. Um, she had a late nineties Pontiac. It was like a Grand Prix or Grand Am. And then she was getting a VW Bug, um, like one of those little Beatles. Um, and so she was like, yeah, I'm getting that this weekend. I'm super stoked on it. And I was like, what are you doing with your old car? And she was buying the new one private party. So she had to sell her old one in order to like have the full funds to buy this new one. So she had to sell it that week. And so I was like, well, how much do you want for it? And at this point I was 15. So in Indiana, um, which is where I'm from, you have to be 16 uh, to have your license. And so I didn't even have my license. I had my permit, um, but I was like, oh, it would be cool if I could have my first car. Let me turn on Do Not Disturb. Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Um, let, me, uh, let me see if I like want this as my first car. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went home, ran it past my parents, and I was like, yo, I might have a really good deal on this car. Should I buy it? Is this like, maybe I could flip it and make a whole bunch of money. That would be great. And they were like, no. If you're, uh, if you're listening in, not watching the video, big thumbs down from the parents. They were not, uh, not really game for it, but ultimately they said, it's your money. It's your life. It's your decision. If you want to risk it, go for it. Um, and so as the week progressed, I kept following up and I was like, did you sell the car? No. Did it sell? No. And then finally, uh, she was getting the car either, um, Saturday or Sunday and it would have been Friday. And I was like, Hey, do you need to sell the car? Cause like, I'll give you 800 bucks for it. I think she wanted somewhere in the mid teens. Um, and then she was like, I'll take a grand. I was like, I'll give you 800. So I got my first car for 800 bucks, um, detailed it, cleaned it up and then sold it for 14. And so at that point I had proof of concept <clears throat> that something would work with like the buying and selling of vehicles. Um, and so I did that and I was like, what if I could do that with an enthusiast car or something else? Like maybe not just an $800 Pontiac. It was a good starting point. Um, but what if I could do it with cool stuff? And it was kind of rocky. Um, I won that first one and then I lost on the next one. Cause like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have any, um, I didn't have a huge, um, supply of knowledge about cars. Mm -hmm. And so I took a loss on like the next couple and it was really up and down. Um, and then on top of that, I realized in, in every different state, the limit varies as to how many vehicles you can have per year, uh, without a dealership license. And so in Indiana, it's pretty high. I think like California, for example, is like four or six Indiana's close to a dozen. Um, look it up for your state if you're interested in this, but there is a cap as to how many vehicles you can have. Um, so I was like, I can't really do this all the time. Plus I didn't have unlimited funds and a huge parking lot to store a whole bunch of cars anyway. Um, so I was like, what else can I do with cars? Cause clearly I like this and clearly there's profit in it. Um, so then I started detailing cause that's, 
um, that's a pretty standard job. Like you see a lot of car washes, you see a lot of detailers, that's mm -hmm. more traditional. Um, so I started that doing like $50 details or $100 like paint correction and polish and wax and hustled my face off uh, doing details like that and started a detailing business. And then finally, the big, I would say, breadwinner for me now, and this is um, the domain that I focus on the most, is marketing. So think of a real estate agent, but instead of helping someone sell their house, you're helping them sell their car. Um, so I'll come in and like take photos, detail a vehicle, uh, write a really good description, and then help a private party seller sell their vehicle for top dollar. Um, so instead of trading it in or selling it to CarMax, then they can come to me um, and I can help them sell at private party for either a small flat fee or a commission. Um, and then I get paid out that way and it's a win, win, win. So I have all these different businesses, kind of a long rant, but that's the, that's the origin story of all of them, detailing, marketing, and then um, buying and selling. Still, So I still do that for vehicles that I like. Um, I've had a whole bunch of stuff that's pretty cool. I don't know what you're into specifically, but um, seems like I probably had it. <laughs> no, that's dope, though, because uh, of course I hear a lot of content creators or entrepreneurs that flip cars, but what you're doing is totally different though, where you market cars, people that want to sell them, right? And of course, that is a, t that is a hassle. You got to clean up the car and make sure the maintenance is there. And exactly. It does take time, right? So are you, you said you sell it to another third party. So you're the middleman to the middleman that sells the car? Uh, no, not so much. Um, so I'll go in and let's say you want to sell your vehicle and you mm -hmm. have, I don't know, 2010 Honda Civic. I have no idea what you drive, but let's say you have a 2010 Honda Civic. Um, so I'll go in, sometimes I'll detail it and clean it up, um, but I'll take really high quality photos. Um, I'll write a detailed description of it and then I'll promote it on all the different platforms like OfferUp, Craigslist, Facebook, oh. cars.com, et cetera. Um, awesome. And then okay, if yeah. there's any, I call it discovering hidden value. Um, so if there's anything that you as the um, owner may not recognize as maybe valuable about the vehicle, then I'll come in with my kind of trained eye and then find that value. So maybe you bought the car new and you have all the maintenance records for it, but you wouldn't have maybe posted that in the ad. Um, so I'll be like one owner, clean Carfax, really nice. Or maybe it's the highest trim line. It's the EXL instead of the LX or whatever it may be like new tires, just the, the hidden value that may be overlooked by someone who's like more accustomed to their vehicle. Um, so, I'll find the value, write a really good ad, take really good photos, and then blast it off onto all the different platforms. And that gets the most possible eyes on the vehicle and it showcases it in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps itself for top dollar, but they're ultimately the one who transacts. So you would be selling your Civic to the end buyer. I'm just creating the ad. Um, yeah. And then a lot of the times I'll come in and detail it when I'm there as well. And do you also, I feel, because I, I only flipped <laughs> just two cars in my life. And okay. I remember, like, I, I don't know much about cars, but when I was selling it on, it wasn't five miles, but I think it was let go or maybe Facebook marketplace. I think it was let go. Anyways, the guy came in, had like okay. almost no knowledge of cars. And he was asking me all these questions, like these technical car terms and, and questions. I was like, oh my God, I have no idea. He's scoping me out here. Right. Um, and so I feel that the, average person who doesn't know much about cars they can be you know if they don't know much then that person that doesn't know quite a lot can say you something and you know take yeah job. leverage that take you or take that as an advantage and basically get it for cheaper right so you also handle that aspect of like negotiation right. getting the highest price yeah possible. so i'll help them out um okay also that's a huge part um for sure like if they want to run anything past me um, in that regard, like, oh, they're asking about X, Y, or Z. Is this legitimate? Is this a big thing? Um, they can ask me as like a resource. Um, and then on top of that, if there are any scams, if something seems fishy and they're like, ah, this person like wants um, to send me a check and have like a shipper come pick it up. That's a pretty telltale sign of a scam. Okay. Um, so I can, I can guide them with my expertise as well. Um, so 
Wait, let's break it down for a second. So you created a domain and it's going to be a local business, obviously, right? So you can actually yeah. go there, take the pictures, negotiate. So you made a domain and how do you find people? Because, you know, of course you can leverage Google ads uh, or Don't SEO. Do that. I'm no, big okay. into, uh, I'm Facebook big into ads. lean businesses. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of people flaunt revenue numbers um, and a lot of people run really bulky businesses. And that's, mm-hmm. I guess, from where I've come from. Uh, that's just not my style. Um, and I think it's better, especially as a beginner, to kind of bootstrap your way up. If you don't have a lot of money to start, then you don't need to learn Facebook ads and Google ads and SEO and all this stuff um, and spend the money that correlates to that, like spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on um, all these different services and all this different stuff, ads specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I do is, uh, Google sites is completely free. Um, and that's what I had for my first website. I still use that now. Um, I just have a custom domain, which I think it's 10 or 12, uh, 10 or 12 bucks a year, um, for Google domains, just to get a site, um, like www.maxisautomotivemarketing.com, for example. And then that is linked to the Google site. So that's 12 bucks. Um, and then I buy business cards as well and I'll have business cards, but those are really the only two expenses, Mm -hmm. um, with the marketing business. And in terms of, um, I guess for your listeners, um, the initial strategy would be cold outreach. So you would just go on Facebook, offer up Craigslist, et cetera, and find people who are selling their cars and ask them, Uh do you want help with marketing? Um, that way you don't have to do all the crazy ad spend and learn that and people find you, you're just initiating a conversation saying, can I help you out? And they say no. And you part ways. And if they say yes, then you serve them. And like my goal specifically, and everybody who I've taught to do this as well, um, the goal is to charge X amount and provide far above X uh, and like returned value. Um, Mm -hmm. So if I charged 200 bucks to market someone's car, I want to bring them at least $200 worth of value back. Let's say they would have sold it for $1,500. Um, they sell it for $1,700 or $2,000 because I stepped in. Um, anyway, I run it super lean. Um, so it's basically just called outreach on these different sites. And that's where people are selling their cars anyway. Okay. Um, so it's not like they're completely cold because they, you already know that they have the need. Yeah, um, makes sense. So when you run the ad, you're saying that, of course, on these platforms like let go, um, you could run a promotion, right? Is that what you yeah. mean by, by ads? Okay. And you could, yeah, you could do a like boosted post, sponsored yeah. post um, or anything like that. But okay. Yeah. To and answer your question. So say a car, you know, the base level, base cost is $1,200. Would you only charge a commission only if you've gained or made some profit there? Like say if you break even, would you, you know, still charge a, your, your client or how does that work? Yeah. So I have, it's, it varies uh, vehicle to vehicle. So for mm-hmm. something lower budget, it's usually a, a very small flat fee and there's mm-hmm. not as much um, work that I personally do for it. So maybe with, um, with something that's 1200 bucks, no one's going to fly in to buy that vehicle. Um, So you can just post it on like local networks, Craigslist, um, Facebook marketplace and offer up, for example. And those are all local marketplaces where you're not getting that crazy national coverage. Um, And so the the expense and expenditure can be a lot lower versus something like, let's say a Mustang GT. Um, Someone might travel from in the same region so you would charge more and then post to more places um, all within that region. And then let's say you have something really hot like um, a Lamborghini or a 911. Um, someone from the East Coast is willing to buy in that instance, something from the West Coast. And so you'll want to post it nationally and get national exposure. Um, and with that, there's more legwork. You have to post on more platforms. And so then as a result of me doing more work and getting more exposure, which also gets a higher price for that vehicle, um, I would get a higher cut or commission, whether that's flat fee or commission, I should say. So you do sell a lot of exotics within, you said in Indiana, right? 
or in your local uh, area? So I'm in California right now. I split time. Okay. Um, my home base and where I'm from is Indiana. Uh, there's not too much crazy stuff uh, <laughs> in the Midwest, um, but there's a lot more affluence um, on the West Coast, specifically Southern California. I'm in Orange County, um, which is, I would say, kind of hyper affluent. It's mm-hmm. very well off. Um, a lot of people drive exotics. Um, And just the standard is much higher here. Um, So I would say the majority of my, my clients in that front um, come from California. Okay. And you still apply that same principle where you do, it's not necessarily cold outreach because these people, they're willing to sell their cars. And so you go on Craigslist, you know, maybe Facebook marketplace and you'd be like, Hey, I can help you sell your car. Right. Yeah. So I would say that's the biggest strategy and you can, like at any point, if you need a client, and this is the cool part about marketing. If I'm like, I, if I were to be in a position where I was like, I need money, I need to service a client, I would know where to find them because every day vehicles are being listed. So every day you have opportunities for new clients. Mm -hmm. Um, The cool part about where I am right now, I would say is it's primarily referral based. Um, So I service clients and provide powerfully enough to them to where they're going to want to tell their friends who then later on sell their car and then it's referral based as opposed to cold outreach. So instead of being on the hamster wheel of like constantly doing cold outreach, yeah. it's just they come to you. Provide, yeah. Provide so how, how many cars have you sold or vehicles of that matter? Have you, how many vehicles have you sold so far? Um, so when you ask that question for me um, versus marketing, um, so I don't like to say that I've sold this many vehicles because I've helped market, Mm -hmm. um, but hundreds for sure at this point, um, millions of dollars worth of vehicles, which is pretty cool. So, and, and out of those hundreds, how many did you have to kind of be face to face with the person? Because I feel that in sales, there's a different skill set between really negotiating face to face with someone. And of course, online. Yeah. So, um, all of my clients are face to face. I've thought about doing virtual consults with, um, like telling someone what to do and how to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. but in regards to all of the clients, uh, eh, clients that I have, um, they've been face to face that way I can show up, um, like deliver the service there and yeah, it's all face to face. Well, mostly face to face because you said like, if there's an exotic car and someone's from the East coast, then they can buy it. But of course, are they willing to call you or do they, yeah, do they call you for like more details, for example, about the car? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess um, in that, in that instance where they're not physically and approximately there mm-hmm. um, from the, from the buyer's end, there are some that aren't face to face on the clients that I service on the selling end. It's all face to face. Okay. So yeah, tell us about you like your, your sales strategy here, because of course the buyer wants to decrease the, say if you list it for like whatever car it is, $1,400, that buyer is not going to buy it for $1,400. He or she is going to want it to have it for, for example, $1,200 and you want to maximize your profit. So you have to, there's a fine margin where you want to, you both want to meet where you're both happy, right? Now as a salesman doing this for hundreds of cars, do you have like a sales process, not a script per se, but something, some insights to help maybe other car sellers um, really get more revenue? Yeah, I would say so. Um, And above a script, because a script uh, is, it can be very powerful for sure, but to a specific circumstance versus Mm -hmm. understanding concepts or frameworks, those can be applied really anywhere. Um, So that's what I definitely prefer. And I would say the biggest tip for this would be um, understanding the the fears, pains, goals, aspirations, and circumstance of the buyer. Um, so if I'm talking to, let's say someone who has a $1,500 budget, um, who like they're working minimum wage, they need something reliable and they're like very, um, they're very dollar focused. They're like, I need all of the value I can get out of this vehicle. I'm willing to go to great lengths for it. And like, I need to push this as far as possible. You're going to assess that circumstance and assess like their goal uh, differently than let's say someone who's 
a lawyer who's making 300K a year, who has a $150,000 Porsche, who's like, I just need the car sold. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not optimizing for top dollar. I'm optimizing for maybe convenience or speed Um, versus, yeah, someone that may, may have less money is willing to do more groundwork. They don't care about the ease or the convenience. Um, They want like the most value per dollar versus someone in a different circumstance um, may not be optimizing for that. And I would say that was when the game changed because like for me, I'm very number centric personally. Like if the numbers make sense, go for it. If the, if the, if the numbers don't make sense, then don't go for it. Um, it. Versus like, let's say a mom buying a minivan. She doesn't care as much about like a one or $200 discrepancy. She doesn't want to go and deal with buying a vehicle. She wants it to look good, to smell clean, to be safe and have all the maintenance records. But if that means she's going to pay a little bit more for that vehicle, she probably will. Mm -hmm. Um, So it all depends on who you're dealing with specifically and just understanding their circumstance and their context, where they're coming from. And that can give you, um, I don't want to say a lot of leverage, um, but a lot of insight uh, on, on how to sell. But do you have to know this yeah, on the spot or do you do your due diligence? Say like someone contacts you via Facebook. I don't know. Um, do you kind of do some research on the back end to be like, okay, this person is a soccer mom. She needs this minivan or the CRV, for example, uh, to bring her kids yeah. to a soccer game. And maybe I can get some more insights on what she needs, when she needs it. And from that, I can kind of use that information to, you know, maximize my, my, uh, my margins here. Yeah, definitely. Um, So for example, Facebook Marketplace, um, you can see, um, you can see the profile of whoever's messaging you. So you Mm -hmm. can get insights that way. Like you just, um, in the conversations tab, you would click on that profile and you could see like, okay, this is their name. Cool. Um, They have a profile picture. It's like her, her husband, two kids that look young and it's like very soccer Mm mom-esque versus I don't know, a bachelor male that's 25, like even broad demographics help very much. Um, And then in terms of like national sales, for example, um, a lot of people, especially when you're dealing with higher dollar vehicles, um, you want to make sure that someone's serious about it. Um, And so more, more infos exchanged early on Um, especially when buying a vehicle out of state. So like you can look up someone's name um, or if they're contacting you from um, blanklawfirm.com, like john at johnslaw.com email, you can go to uh, johnslaw.com and find out more about maybe their circumstance. Wait, I had to ask this because I've never, I mean, I've heard people flip cars, but never create a domain name and market it and whatnot. Like do do the full service. Where did you come up with this idea? This is totally new to me. Yeah, uh, it is very new and it's very, I would say blue ocean. Yeah. Um, Right now, I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, but like detailing, for example, detailing is very saturated. Um, Like, you know, a detailer that's in your town. Everyone has like the town's car wash or the town's detailer. Um, It's not like many people do auto marketing, which is crazy. Um, But for me, like the origin of that specifically was uh, getting into real estate. I was big into real estate. That's what I thought I wanted to do with my career. Um, I was like, I'm going to be a real estate agent. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. I want to be a real estate investor. I don't have cash to do that. Like I can't do this. And then there's wholesaling. Like there's a whole bunch. If you want to dive down the uh, real estate rabbit hole, feel free. If you have, you know what I mean? Um, anyway, I was watching a lot of, uh, real estate YouTube. Um, Graham Stephan was like on the rise. He's massive now. (laughs) Um, but he was, uh, he was blowing up meet Kevin. Um, and then there were these guys in Canada. Um, and that was, that was kind of the big origin for me. Um, there's a group of guys in Canada that all do real estate in uh, London, Ontario. So I went up to an event, uh, drove up and met like meet Kevin and Graham, Um, They flew in from the West Coast and along with all these Canadian guys, and we were just talking real estate. 
Um, and I was like, this is really cool. They're doing really, really well for themselves. They have passive income. This is great. But real estate like isn't my thing. Houses don't light me up in the same way that cars do. Mm-hmm. But I realized, okay, real estate agents sell homes and they get a commission X amount, X percentage from that home selling. Why can't I do the same with cars? And thus auto marketing <laughs> kind of came to fruition. So yeah, that, that is like a, a, like a new category. And it's kind of cool that you kind of combine two different, two different aspects of businesses, kind of thinking about real estate and, you know, the commission based model with, with cars. So how have things escalated from like year one, year two, how many sales have you, like, did you see that hockey, cur- the hockey curve growth? Was it very linear in the beginning? Like how have you kind of adapted or changed over a period of time as you got better and better? Yeah. So it's, it has definitely changed um, because early on, like some of my first clients were people from my church. Um, Mm -hmm. They knew that like I would work with vehicles and it would, let's say be that soccer mom who's selling their minivan. It's like, can you detail it um, and like market it and sell it and help us sell our van? And of course it was yes. And it was like partially charitable because they're people that I went to church with in my like tiny hometown um, to now running it a more as a business mm-hmm. um, and B on the West coast where there's way more affluence. Like that was a huge game changer um, as well. And then also me personally becoming more confident in my skill set, and then the value that I deliver um, allowed me to a bring more value. Cause like I'm becoming more proficient at this. I'm understanding things more learning from each vehicle year after year, um, I'm getting better. Thus I can provide more value. Thus I can charge more. And then also working with, um, higher net worth clients and just cooler, more exotic vehicles. Obviously if you're making, I don't know, 10% on a $2,000 car, it's not much 200 bucks, um, flat fee for like a local listing, for example, versus, a 5% commission on a $25,000 Mustang or a a 3% commission on a hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini. Like there's a lot of variance in how much you get paid Mm -hmm. per vehicle. And it's essentially the same work. Wait, so why did you move to, you said Orange County, California? Did you have family there or did you meet people? Did you network? Yeah, networked. um, And I just outgrew my small town. Um, So was from the Midwest and then, I traveled quite a bit. Uh, I went to school in Hawaii, which is crazy um, for some time. And then uh, lived in Colorado for a short time as well. And I had family out in Colorado. That's kind of what drew me out there specifically. Um, Because I knew like I had my aunt and uncle in Colorado in case something happened. It didn't feel as far from Indiana. Um, But then I was like coming out here for events every month, it seemed. always to California and it was either San Diego, LA, um, primarily a few things in Irvine, um, but nothing crazy. Started meeting people and then loved the climate, loved kind of everything that it had to offer. And a lot of people like dream and aspire to be one day maybe in California. Um, And so I was like, why, why am I artificially kind of stifling myself and my dreams and my growth when I can Mm -hmm. do this? Like, I'm young. I have my own venture. It's not like I'm reliant on a job that's in one specific place. Yeah, I'll have to start fresh. I don't have the same connections and network that I have maybe back home or that I've cultivated in Colorado. However, why can't I start this here? Um, And so, yeah, I just took a leap. And I guess that's that's also my personality more, um, more than anything, just kind of going after it, not letting things not letting opportunities go by the wayside. So if someone wants to do this, maybe replicate your model of some sort and they live in a, you know, not in a very affluent area and maybe it's okay for them to start. They're making a few bucks here and there, but if they really want to scale, do you think that it's kind of imperative to move, take that leap to a more affluent area to get more? No. Um, I don't think it's imperative. Um, 
I think that it would be advantageous. Yes. Okay. Um, but I think the, the perspective that I come from is pretty good, pretty cool in this specific instance, because I do come from like a tiny town and there's really not much money. There's when I had my GTR, it was like the craziest, most mind boggling thing in my hometown. Like the coolest thing might be a Mustang GT. Um, yeah, I can't even think of a Corvette in my hometown. Like that's where the bar is. Um, versus here, there's anything you can dream of uh, in Southern California on PCH. It's pretty cool. Um, but like back in my hometown, there's nothing crazy. So you think, oh, I can't do this. I can't get clients. Even if I got some, they're all junk cars and I can't make that much money with it. Um, but at that point, it's just like get resourceful, either service more clients, bring more value, or I would say the biggest thing would be expand your, your reach. Um, mm -hmm. So even though in my town specifically, there may not be anything greater than, let's say, a Mustang GT, um, in a few towns over, there's more wealth, there's more affluence, there are some lakes uh, 45 minutes away, and there are, there are some like exotics, there's more... Um, affluence, higher net worth. Um, same with maybe someone who lives in a city, like you may live in kind of the slums of that city, but 45 minutes away, there might be the, the hyper affluent part of that city. You never know. Um, in the same way, if you live, like I'm two hours away um, from Indianapolis, which is like the, the capital of Indiana, it's the big city. Um, and then the closest even remotely big city is Fort Wayne. And that's still nearly an hour away. Um, but if I was serious about getting this business off the ground and I really wanted to make it happen, who's to say that I can't go service clients there? Like mm -hmm. even if I couldn't move for whatever reason, or even if I didn't want to, um, I could still get clients in Fort Wayne or Indy, just get a, like a Prius or a fuel efficient vehicle, drive out there or batch a few like set up appointments at 11, at two and at five, and then you could hit multiple in a single day, a single trip. So I would say don't let your circumstances define your success for sure. Um, are there environments that are more conducive to it? Yeah, um, like in the neighborhood that I live in, out in California, people drive McLarens. So it's easier to get clients with McLarens versus I don't know for sure if there's a McLaren dealership in Indiana period, but uh, there are McLarens. I've seen them there. So who's to say that's not possible and who's to say that you couldn't market that. Mm -hmm. And even then, if you live too far away from the city, I think you can literally DM anyone on Instagram, maybe a photographer, you know, kind of create a small team to help you out of some yeah. sort and get creative there. No question. Yeah. That's not even calling in outside help at all. Oh, yeah. Exactly what you talked about. Like you could run ads, you could do vir eh, virtual consults where you would get on the phone with someone, maybe tell them to go get it detailed and then tell them what photos to take. Mm -hmm. Like there are a lot of opportunities and possibilities if you start looking for them. Yeah. So I feel that a lot of entrepreneurs, once they find their blue ocean, they want to have that tunnel vision and just focus on that one craft, but others they're willing to really work on their blue ocean, but at the same time, spread the knowledge and help others out. But there's a kind of a, there's kind of like a, a downfall to that because if you're kind of creating a personal brand or helping others value you grow your business, um, you're not going to output as much for your business, right? In your case, you're helping automotive enthusiasts become automotive entrepreneurs. So why did you take that route of really helping others as well and build your business? Yeah, so a few things on that um, with marketing specifically, like, yes, there are a lot of clients and sure fewer people drive like supercars and exotics, but go on Craigslist or go on eBay specifically or Auto Tempest really anywhere and look at how many new uh, listings for vehicles come on each and every day. So if there's like a scarcity issue that you face of like, oh, what if I can't get clients or why would you share, um, share this knowledge of automotive marketing with mm -hmm. others? Aren't they going to steal your clients? And it's like, no, there are so many clients and um, 
so many clients to be had and people to be served, people to help each and every day um, that I don't need to fight for that. Like right now, sorry, um, right now there's like a limited number of people that I can serve and from others that I've taught this business model, like they can only serve so many people per day, week, year. So the rest of the people that aren't getting help with marketing are going unserved. That's where anybody else could step in. Um, so that's number one. And then number two is like, I've been there and that's why I want to help out and give back. Cause like we talked about, I was working at Dairy Queen for 725 or 735 an hour, minimum wage. Like I'd loved cars. I'd had huge dreams and aspirations um, of one day owning like maybe a $10,000 car. That was the pinnacle. Like what if I could own a used Mustang GT or specifically for me, it was an older Porsche. Like what if I could drive and own a beat up old Porsche just to have that badge? Like that would have been my dream. Um, and then it came true and it's like, whoa, this is possible. So being able to see myself in that former position and seeing where a lot of friends are as well. Like obviously being into cars, I go to car meets. I have a lot of um, auto enthusiast friends who don't know how to make money with this, um, whether it's they're losing a ton of money on the vehicles that they buy or they have a whole bunch of detailing knowledge and uh, supplies in their garage, yet they don't do anything with it. Like they'll clean their car, but they don't know how to start a detailing business or they love taking photos of vehicles, but they don't know how to market other people's vehicles or start the business around it. Like a lot of people have the pieces and the components. And so what I help uh, auto enthusiast with is just adding the other pieces. And usually it's um, like the business structure and the format that people struggle with because mm -hmm. they have the spark that they love cars and they have a certain skill set, whether that's auto photography or they know how to detail really well, um, or they know how to wrench on a car or something like that. They have a skill set, they have the passion, they just don't know how to kind of bring it all together. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where I come in. Because it is tough because like you said, you have that skill set of knowing, you know, about cars, whatever vehicle it is, but again, you have to know how to open up a domain do the maintenance right. for the domain, do the marketing, do the sales. And, you know, maybe the guy just wants to fix cars, for example. And you did, as a solopreneur, when you first started out, you did everything, right? Right. So what was the toughest spot? Like the, tough, the toughest thing? Was it finding clients? Was it actually closing a deal or closing a sale? Um, or what? Well, like maybe social media marketing. I don't know if you did like a, a whole brand around this. So what was the toughest thing for you doing all these tasks? Yeah, so I would say early on, it probably wasn't closing um, closing sales, luckily, because um, like I said earlier as well, um, my first few clients were people from my town, people in my network, people that I went to church with. Um, so there was already rapport established, um, but that's, that's where a lot of people get hung up. They don't feel confident in their craft yet because like they're just learning this. Um, so even though I'm teaching them everything of what to do, they don't feel like they can do it yet. So as a result, when they reach out to clients, they don't come through with like confidence, knowing that they can deliver value. Mm -hmm. um, so then sales, like they've never sold. So it's just all like rocky. They don't own their worth. And then that, that's translated in the sale of their service as well. And they don't know exactly what to say. So it's a little bit rocky. I would say that's probably um, the biggest thing that I've seen others that I've helped struggle with. Um, for me specifically, um, I would say it was making the jump from familiar to like next level vehicles. Um, so specifically, it was an old uh, Porsche Speedster, speaking of Porsches more. Um, I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Like who, I know that I'm good at marketing like minivans and Mustangs and kind of normal stuff, mm -hmm. but like an authentic Porsche Speedster, something classic, something that's a Big super jump. high value vehicle. 
could I do that? I don't know. Um, so there was that internal battle and same with like detailing. Yeah, you can detail a 20 year old Honda Civic and you're like, oh, I'm good, I can do this. But let's say someone brings you a brand new car, you start getting nervous and you're like, what if I scratch it? What if something happens? Um, but I would say for me, it was that like jumping into the league of uh, mm -hmm. collectors, vehicles, uh, specialty vehicles and exotics from like being in the small town um, and servicing decent vehicles, but nothing at that next tier. Yeah. So you kind of threw yourself like in the pool and, you know, it was either sink or swim at that point. And maybe th that huge jump was really vital because maybe you could have gone uh, to the next level, but going to California to a really affluent area was that huge jump. And because you survived yeah, that. that. So yeah. Sure. So what was like the most exotic car that you uh, yet you drove uh, that you sold uh, that you came across? Um, I want to say the Speedster was, was right up there. Um, I don't know. There's, I'm still waiting to shoot a Ferrari F40. Um, so I have, I have an F50, um, right on my wall right here. Um, like those were the two dream cars. Those are both like one plus million dollar, uh, Ferraris. Very hard to find for people that don't know cars. Um, but I mean, I've shot like a lot of stuff up to that point. So GT3 RSs, Huracans, um, 458s, 488s, all these different vehicles um, like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, nothing like super above that tier other than probably the Speedster, um, but a lot of stuff in that echelon for sure. Um, mm -hmm. It's a blast. So 911 turbos, R8 V10s, um, manual stuff's always fun, especially when it's exotic. So, so I listen to a lot of other entrepreneurs like Gary Vee and say, like, look, you gotta, of course, once you start making money, you gotta reward yourself. Right. But you could use that money to reinvest in your business or reinvest in other businesses. So if you want to go back into real estate and you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, uh, maybe you can make something of that, or you can buy and reward yourself a really cool exotic car. Right. And in your case, do you kind of have an ambition or a vision to really get your first exotic car if you don't have one already, or really just reinvest into other uh, businesses or your business right now? Yeah, so I've, I've had a fair share of cool cars. Um, and I really like it because there's, um, there's a positive feedback loop. So I'll make money with detailing or mainly marketing mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much pure profit. Um, and then the bank account keeps going higher. Cause like I said earlier, I run a really lean business. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not like I have a whole bunch of expenses going out all the time. Yeah. Um, so I can accumulate cash wealth, um, profit from that business. Um, and then like we talked about with the first car, um, I realized like you can buy a vehicle and sell it for more, or you could buy a vehicle, drive it for some time and sell it for what you bought it for. Um, without losing money. So a lot of people's um, big expenses are housing and transportation. Transportation is mm -hmm. the second biggest expense in most households. Um, and so if you could bring that number to zero, uh, which I've managed to do with like buying a vehicle strategically, because um, obviously I know how to market it well and do all these things. Like I have an eye for a good deal and then I can sell it for top dollar for what it's worth. Um, I don't really lose money on vehicles that I drive. And so I can reward myself from money that I make in detailing and marketing mm -hmm. to buy really cool vehicles to, to then make more money on. Yeah. Does that make sense. That does. Yeah. Um, so you're not really losing money at work at worst, like breaking even maybe. Right. Yeah. So I've had, like I had an AMG GT. Um, now that car had like $135,000 sticker. Um, I got a two years old for 65 K and it sold for that. Um, I've had two GTRs, which is pretty cool. Um, a white one and a black one. Um, the black one I bought for 45 and sold for 45, the white one I bought for 40 and sold for 45. So I made money doing that. And so it's like, yes, these are my dream cars. Um, and these are my rewards. Like I love being able to drive these. Um, yet it can still be at either no loss or at a profit. 
Um, so yeah, I would say you need to reward yourself, but you can also do it strategically. Um, in my opinion. No, no. Yeah. That's definitely, that's definitely dope. Like if you can buy any luxury item that you want, but you have some knowledge in it, then you can treat it as an investment, you know? So if you love exactly. watches, if you love watches, exactly. that's what I was just about to say. Watches yeah. are huge with that. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. You can buy a watch. You can, you know, floss with it, flex with it, whatever. But if you know the worth and you can sell at a higher point sometime in the future, then it's not really just a luxury item that you're going to use, but it's actually an investment as well. Same thing for you cars. Both. Yeah. yeah. It so feels better like, doing that because at least for me, I'm like, if I would get something, I don't know much yet about watches. Um, like let's say I went into a, a Rolex um, authorized dealer mm-hmm. and just bought a Rolex, it would depreciate, I'm pretty sure, um, from the get-go versus I know a lot of people that buy older Rolexes that are either appreciating or they buy them under value and then sell them for a profit. Like being able to wear that would feel so much better than knowing that I just lost a few thousand dollars because I wanted to flex this Rolex or whatever yeah. it may be. Like the cool thing with your model is that it can serve other industries. It doesn't have to be cars. It can literally be like watches or whatever, or I don't know, any other luxury item that you can, you know, that you can possibly have your model that you can, can think work. Of. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to be not, yeah, yeah. You have to be knowledgeable in it at least, you know, and then from there, learn to sell the marketing, setting up the domain, et cetera. Right. But it's really just yeah, leveraging. It's pretty evergreen, your, I would say. Yeah. And like the cool thing about it is that, Yes, you may not like market. Like, if you ask someone, you gotta do marketing, you gotta do sales. They may sound boring, but the fact that you're doing this around your passion makes you want to do it even more. Yeah. Right? Because if you think about it, like, say you go to school for business and you're taking a marketing class, that can be so boring. But if you love cars and you're kind of intertwining cars and marketing, then okay, that's when things come become interesting. Right. right? And I mean it it's cool because you could do this with anything like, yeah. I don't know if I can say the word, but G U N S. Uh, now nah, you can say it. Like, don't worry, man. <laughs> someone's into guns or whatever. Uh, antique guns. I don't know if it would get like flagged on YouTube or podcast, but um, yeah. Like if someone's into guns, antique guns, collectible guns, anything like that. Like I, I have pretty much no knowledge or no interest in guns. I've shot them a few times. That's about the extent of it. Um, but like someone that's really into that, you could help sell that so easily. Like you could turn that into a business for sure. Or yeah, really anything else. Like if you're big into boats, um, like we talked about earlier, your location will affect that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you could find somewhere with boats, whether it's a drive and a commute somewhere with maybe a lake, um, or live on a coast and do it with boats. You can do it with anything. Um, and that's where it gets really fun because if you, like, if you made me sell, I have a microphone and a computer in front of me, like if I had to market computers for people, you, you can hear it in my voice. I'm like, eh, this wouldn't be great. But I see a car and I'm like, ah, cars, bikes, all this fun stuff that I'm super into big into trucks as well. Um, like cars, bikes, trucks, all of it, SUVs, everything. Um, I want to own them all and I want to market them all because like, I'm just passionate about it. And so being able to do that for whatever it is that lights you up, um, it's a game changer, I would say. Yeah. I think the really, the key point is like, again, just have a, have a knowledge base in something, leverage that to create a business and really go off on a tangent from that. Out of curiosity, you said that, I mean, I don't know if you're still kind of flirting with real estate, but just the past couple of weeks, I heard of like a new way to make passive income and it has to do with vehicles, literally renting out uh, trucks. I think I forgot what it was like renting out 18 wheelers and leveraging that. I forgot how it went, but have you heard of that? Of some Yeah. So um, I think it's Turo. Um, and a lot of people did this like a few years ago. Um, you can do uh, Turo which is um, kind of like an Airbnb, but for cars. So instead of auto marketing where it's real estate, like helping sell a home, um, you're renting out a car. And so it's on Turo. It's individual to individual, peer to peer. Um, Excuse me, sorry. Um, Anyway, like people will do that with their own vehicle. Let's say right now I have a Ford Raptor. 
Mm -hmm. um, I could like rent that out for maybe 200 bucks or a hundred bucks a day. Um, and that could, that could help with income or that could help if I finance the truck um, or whatever you're driving, you could rent that out. Um, I think it's just Turo.com. Um, you could definitely do that with, with other vehicles. It's not something that I branched out into. Mm -hmm. um, I have enough on my plate with the other stuff, um, but I'm sure that you could. Like if you lived uh, lived in the desert, um, you could definitely rent like UTVs, ATVs, stuff mm -hmm. like that. That would be a blast. <laughs> um, I personally think the issue with that is you have a lot of liability um, and you have to worry about like insurance and overhead, um, which are pretty big versus like detailing and marketing. Um, they're really lean. I don't have to worry about crazy insurance. Like no one's going to break their neck from me marketing their vehicle. Um, maybe it's super shiny. So they, they look too fast and they break their neck, so yeah. to speak <laughs> in car guy terms. Um, but like no one's going to wreck an ATV when I'm detailing, no one's going to wreck an ATV or run into my building when I don't have a building for marketing. Um, so it's a toss up. It's something that can definitely work. Like there are car rental places, um, enterprise and like, I don't know all the brands, um, mm -hmm. but like it's a proven model. You could do that yourself. Um, there are people that rent out four wheelers and all sorts of different toys, so to speak. You could do that yourself it, and it could be done. No question. And what's your ultimate ambition or vision if you have one for, Automotive, I don't like for, for your business right now. For the marketing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the, I guess next milestone is going to be crossing eight figures um, and vehicles marketed and then um, an F40 specifically. I would love that. Um, and then for me, like to own me, one or to sell one? Well, to market one first, uh, and then <laughs> that would be easier. And then uh, to own one myself. And yeah, that would definitely be the case. Um, I'd love to get like a 458 or 488. Um, that would be great. I would say like on my personal list, um, I haven't yet had a, a, a McLaren, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. Like I've mm -hmm. had the AMG, I've had kind of all the supercars up to that point, but I haven't yet crossed that threshold. Um, and so in the short term, I would say own one of those like 100 to 200 K supercars or exotics. Um, and then later on, like there are some really cool old Porsches, um, F40, like that is the pinnacle and the peak for me. Um, and then I would say like, yes, having money's cool, having money's great. Um, but being of service and adding mm -hmm. value and being helpful, um, is a lot more fulfilling. Like I'm sure there are things that are more lucrative, uh, that I could be doing theoretically. Um, and then especially in the short run, like you can sell and under deliver, but that doesn't feel good and it doesn't pay off in the long run. And so just providing a lot of value to marketing clients that I serve or students that I teach, that's, that's what's fulfilling because my financial needs are met. Like mm -hmm. I don't have transportation costs. I know how to kind of hack that to where I'm driving for free. So my only big expense is like food and housing. Um, and I live pretty minimally and pretty frugally. Um, so I don't need much to sustain my lifestyle. Yeah. So yeah, my financial needs are pretty well met. Um, I don't worry about money really anymore. Um, I'm very focused on it and I want to say concerned about it. Like a lot of my endeavors are money making, but if I had to take years off of working, I could, if I had to make a big pivot or pay for a big bill, like I'm not worried about that, which is an amazing mm -hmm. position to be in. Um, and so money is great. It's cool, but fulfillment, I think fulfillment, yeah, helping others. Big thing. Yeah, for sure. And so are you trying to build, you know, of course you have your YouTube channel, IG, uh, you know, be like a, a personal brand, like a huge personal brand and an influencer in this space. Yeah. Um, 
Yes and no. Um, so yes, for the sake of helping a lot of people, if mm -hmm. I could do that and it's required that I have a big brand for that, then yes. Um, for the sake of a lot of followers or vanity metrics of like X amount of people follow you, um, not necessarily. Like I would rather go in a lot deeper. I would rather have, I would say like a thousand students mm -hmm. than a hundred thousand people that watch me for entertainment because yeah. while like vehicles that I market or details that I do may be satisfying or I can like have fun and do reviews with different vehicles and that's all cool and that's all entertaining it's not transformational um, and there are other people I'll say it there are more people that are a whole bunch more yeah, entertaining than I am um, who have bigger channels and like that is their focus. Um, there's this guy, um, Whistlin' Diesel, and he's, he's like the biggest uh, truck influencer online. He has millions of followers, absolutely massive behemoth channel, and it's entertainment. Like, he destroys vehicles, trucks specifically, um, in like very aggressive ways. Um, and he has a whole bunch of followers, gets a whole bunch of views and it's very entertaining because like he'll blow up trucks um, <laughs> or do crazy launches and burnouts and all sorts of stuff. If you're into that, check him out. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, but to me, like that wouldn't fulfill me on the same level of someone didn't know how to run a business. Um, someone didn't know anything past like how to detail a car really well or how to take really good pictures of a vehicle. And then I can be there and show them how to drive for free or how to turn their skill set into a business and like lift them out of poverty or change their mindset to where they feel that they can do more mm -hmm. when in fact they can. Um, so I'd, I'd rather have a profound impact on a few than massive influence over many, so to speak. Um, but it would be great also if I could have massive um, impact with many like that would be the dream oh for sure and it might be inevitable here that you know you can get that massive following even though you don't want it for the vanity metrics but you know as you provide more value over time i think is going to become ine inevitable because this is a blue ocean it's kind of a new business model that i've at least just heard about yeah and maybe many others as well so i think over time you'll definitely get that as well so Max, I don't want to take too much of your time here. So if people want to find you, hit you up, um, I don't know if you have like a Facebook group or I think you said you had students. So if you have a course, where can they find that? Yeah. So um, automotivemoney.com um, or just connect with me. Like I don't want you to, to go directly from here to buy a program unless you're like, oh, this podcast changed my life. I want to learn from you so badly. Like, cool, great. But also get to know me. Like, yeah. If you like me, if you want to follow me, if you want to understand more, just like follow the socials. Um, I would say YouTube is the big push right now, not on TikTok, um, not on Twitter. Don't do any of that. Like YouTube and then Instagram, because obviously I'm big into photography. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say those two at Max C. Karg, um, K A R G, and then on YouTube, uh, just Max Karg or Automotive Money. I should pop up. Um, and then automotivemoney.com if you want like the business blueprints specifically for how to drive for free, how to turn a profit on vehicles, how to start a marketing business, how to start a detailing business, or how to like ride bikes for free and flip bikes. Um, those are all there. So dope. So I'll put that in the show notes. So if anyone clicks on that, they can check out the links Sweet. and DM you on Instagram, go to your course or watch your YouTube videos for there. Yeah. Definitely connect. Don't hesitate. Um, feel free to ask questions, follow along, like see what I'm into. Um, start a conversation, ask questions if you have them. Dope. So Max, it was a pleasure, bro. For sure. It was great. I appreciate it, Thanks man. Thanks for having me on. Anytime, anytime.